139. Psalm 139. Amen. Psalm 139. Josiah, y'all get it ready for me. I'll be out there in about an hour or so. Or right, maybe an hour and a half. Who knows? Amen. Psalm 139. Are you comfortable? Charlie? You know better. Amen. 18 years. That's, uh, that's unreal for our church. Yesterday, uh, Joseph and I had an opportunity. I got invited out to Pastor David Hilton's. He has a conference going there for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He wanted me to speak on a panel of pastors. And he considers me his pastor, so we had a, a really good time. I, and I, I, you know, there are times that I just, just I, I will soak it up, man. I will write so many pages of notes and get things from people. It just... Because you just, I love the word. I still have a passion for the word of God and what it does in one's life. Amen. This morning, I just want to just talk to you about, well, you were meant to be. Uh, you know, and I say that because I'm, I'm the father of three adopted children. And many times, children come into our lives, people come on, onto this earth, and, and they act like they have no place. Or was, it, was I meant to be? I want to tell you something. You were meant to be here. Amen. God had an intention for you to be here. Psalm 139 says it. And let me just say just flat out. You are God's plan. The earth was given for you. He was given for us to use. But you are God's plan. You are the, if I could say, the apple of his eye. Amen. He loves you like that. So Psalm 139 out of the message says, I thank you, high God, David speaking. You're breathtaking, body and soul. I am marvelously made. I am marvelously made. Fingers toes, joints, uh, a, a specific DNA, fingerprints, amen. Everybody say, look, look what it, say, it says here again. I am, say it with me. I am marvelously made. Amen. Every one of us are. Now, some of us are made a little different, amen, and that's okay. God put redhead on others, amen, put blonde head on others, put no hair on others, <laughs> But you still, you're marvelous, man. You're marvelous. He said, what a creation. I worship and adore in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. Wow. You know exactly how I was made. Bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. We just say, I thank God for Texas. Amen. The Texas is finally... We're seeing a stand up for the unborn. Yes. Amen. amen. After all these years and yes. millions of babies aborted, amen, finally, Texas is standing up. Come on. Amen. I, I know we think, man, the past of the world, this is, I've never seen the world this bad before. This is, it, this is horrible. I mean, the, the politics and, and the COVID and, and this and that and the other thing, it's horrible. Can I tell you something? It's, <laughs> it ain't as bad as you think it is. Amen. In our football arenas, the only thing that happens, the worst thing that happens is Alabama losing. The arenas, uh, four or five hundred years ago, halftime, they turned the Lions loose. Eight people up. Amen. You, you didn't have microwaves. You, didn't, you had to go hunt your food. You had, you had to go uh, plant your potatoes. Amen. Now we go to the store. It ain't near as bad. Come on. That's right. I said ain't near as bad. Come on. Amen. Can get your focus a little bit there. We live in a great time. Can I get an amen? amen? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Amen. So we just lift him up and watch to see what God does. Can I get an amen again? Like an open book, you watch me from the conception to birth. The scripture tells me that. See, if you're not Bible-based, you're going to get lost in this swarry of nonsense that's going on in the world. Amen. You'll get an idea crazy ideas like you can get uh, milk from a bull and eggs from a rooster I mean you get all okay, it, our world is screwed up right now so I got to go back to the book everybody say the book yeah. because the book is where I'm going to get my understanding all the stages of my life all the seasons of my life were spread out before you the days of my life all prepared before I even lived one day. Now, I don't understand that. Can't wrap my head around it. But evidently, God has already planned Jerry Hovatter's life before Jerry Hovatter got here. Right. Amen. He just began to, and he knew my mistakes. He knew my blunders. He knew my get-ups, my go-downs. Amen. He knew uh, where I was from, where I was going to go. And, and I can't figure it out. All I know to do is walk day by day. Everybody Come say on. day by day. And if I can walk day by day, then I can walk in the presence of God and, and hopefully please my Father in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Man, that was a prayer and a message right there. 
that, in, that God intended you. You're intentional. It's, it's a powerful statement. But many of us live a life that's just, uh, uh, it's mediocre at best if we're not careful. And if you're not intentional about life, if you don't look at life and say, this is what I'm going to get done. This is what's going to happen in my life. The word intentional simply means done in a way that is planned or intended. And that's what God did. He planned and he intended you to be here. Amen. He wanted to, you to achieve, amen, to have the right aim and purpose. God has purpose in everything he does and everything he created. We may not have discovered it yet, but God has purpose in everything he has created. Amen. He created it within a purpose. So intent, my friend, is to me, is a powerful word. It's, it's the original purpose. It's the big picture why God did what he did. It's the source of motivation and the reason for creation. Creation wasn't a cosmic experiment. It wasn't just that. As a matter of fact, if you study the book of Genesis, the Bible says that it took God one day to do this, 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 and on the seventh day he rested. It took him six days to create the world, the seventh day he rested. Now, you got to ask yourself a question here, guys. As big and powerful as God is, couldn't God have just created it all at one time? Couldn't God? Could he? Yeah. He could have. He could have said, hey, let there be light, let there be uh, uh, seed time and harvest, let there be animals, let there be water, amen, let the sky split up from, from the earth. Let I, I could, he could have done it all at one time, but not God. God had an intention about this day would happen, this day would happen, and this day would happen. You know what God is telling us? Learn to live one day at a time. Amen. On. Everybody say one day. One day. That's all you promised. I've said this for years. Amen. There's only two days in the Bible, this day and that day. It is how we live this day. That's going to determine what happens on that day. So take a day at a time. Many of us right now, we are so far in the future. Yesterday I was laughing with this guy that was preaching because he made this powerful statement statistically. He said that people, people... Across the board, never think of one thing 100%. As a matter of fact, they are normally only 50% present. Which means right now, I am fighting you for 50% of your presence. The other 50% is thinking about Cracker Barrel. <laughs> Amen? I'm fighting you to keep your attention. Amen. So you can get hold of this word and understand it. God was not experimenting with us. To understand creation, you got to understand the intent of the creator for the creation. When intent or purpose is not known, misunderstandings and abuse is inevitable. If you don't know the purpose for something, you will abuse it. Amen. If you don't know the purpose of a vehicle, you give keys to an eight-year-old and turn them loose. I had JJ drive for me the other day. You know, she's six years old. Smart, intelligent. You all love JJ. Amen. I said, JJ, come drive Paul, Pastor Paul Paul's truck. She got up in my truck and she didn't understand the purpose of that vehicle. She thought this was going to be a conversation while we were moving. <laughs> and she's talking and looking back at me and, and, and we're heading toward this tree and toward that ditch. And I, had, I just threw my hands up and said, JJ, you drive this thing any way, any way you want. She would have lost the intention of it and she would have destroyed that F 150. Amen. So it was important to me, amen, to help direct her as she gets And as she gets older, she'll figure out how to stay on the road. But right now, don't let her drive. <laughs> so I'm going to say it again. If you don't know the purpose of something, you'll abuse it. I don't care. A vehicle, a gun, a chainsaw, a person. Amen. If you don't respect why God made that person and you put that person in your life, you will abuse them. And, and permanence, a purpose has a permanence. The description tells us in Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a man's heart. You ever plan something? And you hear God laugh at you? <laughs> Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. What a man desires is unfailing love. Amen. So plans may change, but purpose remains the same. God's eternal purpose for you and me, we were meant to be here. Ephesians 1.4 says, long before he laid down earth's foundations, long before Genesis 1, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into a celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of, the, of his beloved son. When I read that, I, this is where that revelation understanding that before we ever showed up, we were fought in the mind of God and God found a womb to get you here. Amen. You say, well, no, that was a mistake. Amen. And I've heard parents look at kids and call them mistakes. They're not mistakes. 
God intended on them being here. Yeah. Amen. God wanted them here. He wanted them here for a purpose. And when you live with an intent, it's a powerful thing. When elements of nature lose their purpose, chaos and destruction are the results. When nations, communities, friendships, churches, marriages live without intent, purposeful living, then confusion, frustration, discouragement, disillusionment, disengagement, whether gradual or instant, will happen. You've got to live life with an intention. Amen. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus had an intent when he came into Jerusalem. And he needed, uh, he needed a vehicle to take his ride into Jerusalem. And right before he gets there, verse 28 of chapter 19 of Luke says, After Jesus said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage in Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, now let's back up. Sent two disciples. Go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you'll find a coat tied there. One scripture calls the coat another word for a donkey. You'll find a small donkey, a burrow there. Amen. Well, you'll find it there. And as you enter, you'll find it, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Hmm. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And they were untying the coat. Its owners asked them, why are you untying the coat? They replied, the Lord needs it. And so they released the coat. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the coat, and put Jesus on it. Now here, here I, I don't know if Jesus prearranged, if they understood who he was. But either way, they released this valuable animal over to the disciples to bring back to Jesus. And when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about, first off, that Jesus knew exactly where that little car, he goes into town and he said, I'm going to tell you where he's at. He's at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. There's a jackass tied up over there, and I want you to go get it. That'll make sense to some of y'all later. Amen. So just go over there and get it. So he went over there and they untied it. First off, let me tell you that God knows our place. He knows where you're at. He knows where you live. He knows that I live at 22152 Baptist in Camden Road. Amen. He knows my zip code is better or better than I do. Amen. Some of you may forget your passwords. God's not forgot them yet. Hello. Amen. It's in verse 30, it says, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter, you'll find a coat tied there. Listen, Christianity is God's search for me. You know, religion is about man searching for God, but Christianity is God searching for me, and he doesn't wait till I'm broken to use me, and this is my joy here. As a matter of fact, he can ride me just fine. He was found at the crossroad. Mark 11 tells us this. Mark said, and they went there at their way and found the coat tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. In other words, at a crossroad. And I found that when God finds us, we're often at a crossroad. We can do what is right or we can be heading for what is wrong. We can be heading toward the dark or we can be heading toward the light. God finds us in this spot and at that spot, it's a good place for God to find you. Amen? Because now he can help you make the right decision. Our path is going to determine our destiny. Let me tell you something. Nobody can take your place. Nobody can take that donkey's place. Amen. That donkey was intended to be there. Now, I, I could go off on a little diatribe. Man, I think I will. Amen. Uh, Zechariah 9 9 talks about when Jesus rode in Jerusalem, he came riding in on a donkey. <laughs> Exodus chapter 13, verse 13 tells us for a donkey to live, according to the Old Testament law, that a lamb had to die. So a lamb had to die in order, in other words, be sacrificed because of the value of the donkey. And I know you say, that sounds crazy. Well, it does to me too. Amen. The fact that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would die for us donkeys does sound crazy, don't it? Give me a hand. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. So, so here we find this scene that, that this donkey's there. Let me say this again. No one can take your place. You work a job till you find your work. You work your job till you find your Pastor, I don't like my job. Work your job till you find your work. Amen. God has a work for everybody. Amen. Something for you to do. And there are times in life that what it is, our problem is instant. We want everything instant. We want it now. We want what our parents had before, you know, without, they, they took them 40 years to get that. And then we want it right now. Amen. It's one of our generational problems because we've got phones, everything's instant, news is instant, uh, coffee's instant. Uh, you go through a drive-thru. Wow. 
Guys, I, I honestly remember my granny's and grandpa's uh, old log, log cabin and, uh, and that, that pot belly stove, and they'd put the fire on in the morning and get that fire nice and hot. Amen. As the coals burned down, they'd put the coffee on, and it took a while for the coffee to perk in that little percolator, and you'd see the, 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 the coffee pumping up in that little old, uh, clear uh, thing on top, and, and she'd put food on there, and she'd heat, heat it up or, or cook it, or, or she'd run out. And, yeah, my granny, if you've never seen a chicken's neck wrung before, my granny grab a chicken, grab it around the head, and give it a whoop like that, and pop it, and that thing run off, squirting blood all over the place. And then you got to pluck that chicken, you got to look after that chicken, you got to skin that chicken. Hey Amen. You got to bread that chicken. Now you got to cook that chicken. Right now, I can go through Popeyes just like that. Come on. Somebody done wrung that chicken's neck. Somebody done plucked that chicken. Somebody done fried that chicken. Hey Amen. He put a little spice on it for me. Amen. Throw a biscuit in there and some honey, please. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> You know, why can we like instant? Everybody say instant. Oh, yes. well, we do, don't we? We love that instant. But God's a God of process. He's always working on us. God intended on creating you. Every created being was created with a place in life, a gift discovered with a God-given intention, which will make them a leader in their place, whether it be fish for water, birds for air, man for earth. When you pursue God's priority, what's his priority, Pastor? It's easy, man. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Many times we seek after stuff instead of the kingdom. When you seek after after the heart of God, the head is provided. You seek his heart, you get his hand. Amen. Many times we forget to fall in love with Jesus. And when you fall in love with, not with religion, but when you fall in love with Jesus. Amen. Something just takes place in your life. That's why Pastor Mike last, night, last week was so good. Because he talked about just, just talking to him. You didn't have to sound right. You didn't have to sound, uh, you know, uh, particularly religious. Just talk to him. Amen. And listen to him when he talks back to you. When, when you get out of place in life, stress is the result of that. Whenever you get undue stress in life, it's because you're out of place. Stress is pressure placed on your body emotionally, intellectually, physically, and psychologically. Amen. You get into that fight or flee syndrome. Adrenaline has to be produced to deal with stress, being out of place. Amen. A job you're not made for, a work you don't enjoy. Amen. So you got to be premature death often can happen because of the result of stress. The opposite of stress is peace. Mm -hmm. And Jesus being the prince of peace, not stress. He said, when I'm outside of my place, I become stressed. That donkey was made for riding. Amen. He went in to get that donkey. But you know what he found when he got there? The donkey was bound up. He was tied up. Amen. Never been ridden, and he was tied up. You know when God found you, you were probably bound up, yeah. tied up, yeah. messed up. Amen. Everything about you spoke of, of, of addictions, of issues in your life. Let me just tell you something. Our past problems, addictions, messed up life doesn't determine or stop our usefulness. Problems come from being out of place. Amen. Did you know that devils were not devils in heaven? There was not in heaven devils and angels. They were just angels. But devils are made when angels got out of place. When the angels fell from heaven and got to earth, they became devils. I have found that a lot of folk, when they trespass, when they don't mind their own business, when they get out of place, they become little devils. You ain't got to clap. It's all right. Amen. I know what I'm saying here. And then he said, a donkey that had never been ridden, a personality. I had horses when we were little. Uh, when I say little, six, seven, eight, nine year old. Amen. But I had a horse I, I hated. I actually, and, and I know this is maybe sound a little uh, crusty, but somebody actually asked me, said, what was the name of your first horse? Hmm. I said, well, my daddy called it, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, that's what he called it. That horse had a personality. It was a Shetland pony. Now, I'm saying the correct word, Shetland. I'm not going to tell you what my daddy said. It would rub your leg into a tree, run you next to barbed wire, run you under a limb, and it had a devil in it. I don't know if you've ever had a horse with a devil. This horse had a devil in it. Amen. I can't tell you what happened to Trixie after that, but all I know is I didn't want to ride that horse but a couple of times. Amen. Mean horse. Horses have personalities. I had a horse roll fast. Man, he was fast. He had a person, but, uh, but, and I knew it. And once you understood the animal's personality, you could handle that horse. Amen. I had another horse called Tex. Tex was a big, lumbersome, 16 and a half uh, hands horse, big, big bay horse. And, and he was lazy. 
That was his personality. He was just lazy. He was like Eeyore. Ooh, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. And, and uh, I, I've talked, Betty, I think I talked to you about it once, and I think you told me spurring. Amen. You got, you got, to, you got to drive the lazy out of him. You got to put a demand on him. Amen. The lazy folk, you got to put a demand on them to get them to move. So I had to put a demand on him. I rode that horse, shot off that horse. Amen. It won off that horse. Amen. But I had to put a demand because if I didn't, he Amen. That was his life. Rojo on the opposite end. I had to keep pulling him back, man, because I mean he just wanted to go faster. So you got personality. You got personality. Oh, yes, you do. I'm around people. I pick up personalities real quick. I see extroverts and introverts. Can I be honest with you? All you extroverts, quit being mean to the introverts. <laughs> and all you introverts, quit cussing the extroverts under your breath. Because <laughs> I know you get frustrated with them, too. I mean, hey, I can't stand it. Outgoing, talking, amen, business, like all the time. Yeah, you know, introverts are really bothered with us guys. I understand that. It's your personality. But when God came to, to take care of you and to break you, he wasn't here to break your personality. He wasn't here to change who you are. He likes who you are. He made you with intent. He made you with purpose. He put that inside of you. If you're withdrawn and you like to say, and that's why I get on to certain, I, I have, not this band, but I have gotten on to certain worship leaders because trying to make everybody be the same. Not everybody's going to dance in this house. Not everybody's going to put a hand up. I promise you, if some of you that, I, <laughs> Billy, if I see you throw one hand up in the air, we're in revival. <laughs> I love you like that, man, but I know you, and I wouldn't go over there and pick on him for nothing, but then I know some people that are outgoing, and they'll scream at a football game, and they'll come to church and act like the deadest uh, knot on the log you've ever seen. And the greatest presence in your life is Jesus. Amen. So he doesn't break our spirit. He breaks our will. It's your will that's in trouble. It's your will that's got issues. Your will is that which you determine to do your decision uh, that you believe to be necessary. Matthew 26, 39 tells us that when Jesus went in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went in a little further. He fell on his face. He prayed, saying, Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, my will, but thy will be done. It's the will of the Father that's got to be done. He loves your personality. He made you like this. Amen. Sometimes I, I have to tone my personality down to keep from offending certain people, religious mainly people. Amen. But then I also realize that God made me this holy wild child. Amen. It's who I am. Amen. If I, and I'm hypocritical if I do something different from that. Amen. I just want to be that way. So God didn't break Jesus' spirit. I, I, I'm going to ask you a question. What, what do you think is... His personality was like. I want you to think of that. What do you think Jesus' personality was like? You know, I know when you're outgoing like I am, you, everybody, I think he's outgoing. I think he, he commands the water and, and the winds to be still, man. He, he heals the leper. He, he, he opens eyes of the blind. He's extroverted. He's he going into Simon Peter's house preaching and they're tearing the roof off and lowering people through. Goes over there. He's outgoing. And then there are others going, well, I think he's extroverted, man. I saw him up on the mountain praying. But when I saw Jesus, he backed up out of the crowd and got up on the mountain. And he said, Lord Jesus, I love you, Father. I just want to spend a little time with you. <laughs> Amen. I see him as all four personalities. Simon, melancholy, phlegmatic, and choleric. I see him, all of them wrapped up in him. That's, that's why he's so wonderful. Amen. Amen. And there are times in my life I, I want to be a little more extrovert. Excuse me, introverted. I'm already enough extroverted. <laughs> just want to be a little more introverted. And, and, and after, honestly, on Mondays, that's what I am. Usually, I don't talk to nobody. Amen. I quit church. I'll never do this again. They ain't listening to me. Lord, raise up somebody else. Kick me out. And by Tuesday, I'm fine. <laughs> Let me tell you again, God has a place for every one of us. Amen. He's already prepared it. Our purpose, he needs us. Amen. Say it with me. He needs me. He needs me. Your life was intended. My life was intended. If anyone asks of you, why are you untying this donkey tail? The Lord needs him. God is going to give us an opportunity to fulfill our purpose on this earth. And one of your greatest accomplishments in life is to keep discovering your purpose or why you're here. Purpose, again, is the original intent. What was the reason for my... This is very important. If you've never copied this down, you need to do it. What was the reason for my creation? God is the only one who knows. People ask me, Pastor, why am I here? I don't have the answer because I'm not God. 
Amen. But I can tell you this. If you'll spend time with the manufacturer, you'll find out why you were created. Amen. Spend time with the creator. Amen. Because that, that, that's how you're going to find out. Second, without living with intent, the only, we only exist with no passion. Amen. You got to have passion for living. You have to, if you have no reason to wake up in the morning, you're in trouble. You got to give yourself one more day. Everybody say one more day. Six days. Six days. God created you there. Seven days you rested. Did God need to rest? No. Listen, I'm smart enough to answer my own questions. Did God need to rest? No. God took a day of rest because he was teaching us to take a day of rest. To learn how to chill out after a lot of hard work. Conviction. When you know your purpose, you're convinced of your value. When you know your purpose, you're convinced of your value. When you know your purpose, you are convinced of your value. Everyone has value. Not everybody recognizes it. Everybody has value. Amen. I live among people that are valued. I, every now and then I'll meet somebody that doesn't understand their value. And it bothers me. God made you with, you got value. Now, I'm not talking about over arrogance. I'm talking about you just understand that you, that you have value in your life. And when you understand your purpose, by the way, I've said this a hundred times. When you know your place, it eliminates competition. Amen. I know my place here. Value is determined by refined uniqueness. Your uniqueness makes you valuable. And let me tell you about, about this moment. Refined uniqueness often has to do with seasons in your life. When I was younger, Richard, there were things I could do uniquely that now at 60, I, I can't do it as well. Amen. It, it's, as you move through life, you realize things do change. Hallelujah. But you still have uniqueness in your life and you're still valuable. Refined uniqueness produces significance. Be significant. Spend time with the manufacturer. Let me find out what God intends for you. Let me close with this. And everyone has created, was created, and born with a unique gift that makes them valuable. Find your gift. Serve it to the world. I'm sitting on the stage yesterday, and Pastor David Hilton, that nine pastors there, and there's a lot of folk in that church. It was a really wonderful time for me because a lot of them were people that I'd pastored before. And the question David said, uh, told the people, he said, Pastor Jerry has a unique way of, of always having people who like to serve. Well, I mean, I didn't get this question beforehand. A little heads up would have been nice. He said, how do you get people to serve? <laughs> Go back, uh, if you would, Cheryl, one, one passage. Here. Find your gift and serve it to the world. So I said... And immediately it came to me, John chapter 13. Twelve disciples on a dusty road walk into Simon Peter's house. And they laid head to foot, head to foot, head to foot, head to foot. This is going to be the Lord's Supper. Judas is there. James and John, they're all there. Peter. And they're eating around the table and they're breaking bread. And the next night, that night, Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. Then, you know, the trial, then the crucifixion. It's all fixing to happen. So he's here in John 13. And the scripture says that as they're there, Jesus gets up and he gets a, a bowl. Fills it with water. And he grabs a towel. And he starts walking around to the disciples. And he washes their feet. And if you've never heard me say this, I'm going to say it again. And if you forgot it, you need to hear it again. Jesus taught them at that moment that life is about a towel. It's not about a title. And people love titles. We love positions. We love the accolades and the applause that comes with, hey, look at me. And when the, Jesus came around to Peter, Peter stood up and backed off and said, uh-uh, you ain't washing my feet. And gave attitude. Can I tell you what I believe? I believe Peter, after three years of being with Jesus, thinks now he has a title. He's walked on water. He's been in Mount Transfiguration and met Moses and Elijah. Jesus took me over to Jairus' house when the little girl was raised. Matter of fact, Jesus took me into the Garden of Gethsemane. With Jesus always carries me everywhere. Now you washing my feet. Amen. I got a position. And then Jesus said, Peter, unless I wash your feet, 
you don't have no place with me. Beat us and wash all of me. Because the one thing I can't live without is you. Wash all of me. And there was an humbling moment, because the truth of the matter is, it should have been Peter washing all of their feet. I'll tell you this. When we quit serving one another, we have forgot the purpose in which God created us. God made us to serve. Not to be over anyone or under anyone. He meant for you to be here. Amen. Use your ability. Amen. Your gift. And serve it to the world. You do that. You want to learn how to see God bless you financially? Take your gift and serve it to the world. Amen. People are lined up to get toward your gift. I believe that with all my heart. Last scripture. Last scripture. Corinthians 9, 26. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But I'm running. I'm running hard for the finish line. Amen. I'm giving everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing it myself. Amen. When I get to heaven... I want to see all of you there. Amen. David, you're going to be there with me. Sherman, you're going to be there with me. Amen. Charlie, praise the Lord. <laughs> you're going to be there with me, little sister. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed across the building. We'll say it again. God meant for you to be here. Matter of fact, God meant for you to be in this church this morning. You are here, taking away pain, removing selfishness from us, reminding us that we are unique and valuable. I want to ask this real simple question. You may have known about God, but honestly, in your heart right now, you don't know that you know God. And if you don't know God, this is that moment for you to understand why God put you here. If that's you I'm talking to, put your hand up. If I'm talking to you, just put your hand up and back down. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Pray this for me, Lord Jesus. Thank you that I am uniquely and wonderfully made. Help me to discover my purpose on this earth. Lord, help me to serve it to the world. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah. If any way possible this year, whether it be Thanksgiving, Christmas, if I get an opportunity, I will go to Alabama and I'll see my mama. And my mama, even though she's gotten tired and older and Matter of fact, she's on Walker now. She passed her gift of cooking down to my sister-in-law. And when they cook that turkey and that pan dressing, it's going to have giblet gravy without liver on it. Because my mama would teach my sister-in-law that. She, what happens is she learned how to serve her gift and then teach others to serve. Amen. It's that simple. It's not that hard. Amen. It's not that hard. If you need to tie the offering envelope, it's right in front of you. Amen. Everybody be a giver. I'll say that for the first time that I know of last month, half our giving came in online. Amen. So again, thank God for those that are giving online, those that continually do that. I still write checks, but I gave in a long time ago now. Amen. If you want to give. And listen to me. This is a part of your worship. All right, I, got, I got paid on Thursday. I wrote my check out that day. It's right here inside there, right here. There's a check right inside there, my offering. Amen. My tithe. Hallelujah. For the, I, I do it immediately. You know why? So I don't forget. You say, Pastor, you surely shouldn't forget. No, I shouldn't, but I have. So I write it down. It's the first time of the week. And it's a part of my worship because God's been so good to me. Amen. Let me just mention this. I walked out on the porch in the rainstorm. 18 years ago, we're an 18-year-old church. 18 years ago, I came to 22152 Baptist and Cameron Road, and I stepped in something. 
Got it all over my foot. Got it on the other foot, went up my leg. Stepped in destiny. I had no idea what God had planned. I had very little. Three adopted kids and a broke down vehicle. And then I looked out there and I saw a hot rod and a Harley. The F-150. A charger. That's stuff. And I looked around and saw my family, my friends, two churches that God's blessed us with 18 years ago. You got it. And it's day by day. Give us this day our daily bread. His mercies are new every morning. Every morning. Every morning I get up. It's, it, it's all about today. So you got today. Don't worry about tomorrow. You can't handle tomorrow. Amen. You can't. Have, you need to deal with today and make this the best day you can. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. As we give today, we're believing God for jobs jobs. more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. Amen. David. God bless you, Pastor David, coming on up here. Charlotte, thanks for coming today. Amen. God bless you and all you others that are here in the house. Amen.